tell these boys when you're ready to play this video, and then uh, let us have it. just ain't the story uh, but you know even even though we don't we don't uh, accomplish the things we want to uh, Jesus Christ is all that we need that it does not matter what we go go through in life uh, when we put our focus upon Christ it does not matter what happens in our life I mean turkey hunting is just a little thing I mean we all deal with different situations and circumstances in life but just want to be a reminder to you tonight that uh, no matter how bad your week's gone or even uh, just what you've encountered over the last few days uh, Christ is enough, and when we put our focus on that, it does not matter what happens. We can always be happy. Uh, but again, my name's Darren Barnett, and uh, the name of our ministry is Sixth Day Outdoor Ministry. I have with me tonight my wife Rachel, our daughter Taylor, and our son Ryan. And we are from uh, Lake Milton Baptist Temple, that is in Northeast Ohio. That is our home and sending church. And our focus, of course, is to reach hunters with the gospel, reach fishermen with the gospel. Uh, but many times on Sunday morning driving to church during this time of the year when warm weather's out, uh, you will see uh, boats being pulled by a truck down the highway, and rarely ever are they headed to the house of God. They're headed down to the lake. Uh, during hunting season, you can roll through any property, whether private land or public land, and you're going to find cars on a Sunday morning, trucks parked on the side of the road where folks are out in the stand uh, trying to get their temporary fix in life. That's all hunting is. It's just a temporary fix. It doesn't last long. And there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, we love hunting. We enjoy the outdoors. God gave it to us. But Satan has, has put creation in the way of so many people. They're, they're slipping off into eternity every day without Jesus Christ. Um, it was our gospel track. I know I talked a little bit about uh, Sunday night when we were here, but um, our gospel track, I remember when God began to burden my heart that, you know, we need a gospel track that we can get into the hands of hunters. They're not going to throw to the side. And uh, in 2012, God gave me that burden for the track. I began to pray about it. In 2015, we got our first 15,000 tracks to print. We were planning on going to Michigan. I was excited about a big uh, deer and turkey expo they were doing. There was a lot of uh, thousands of hunters was going to be there. But a blizzard came in, and it did not work for us to go to Michigan. I had some family call and said, you might want to change direction and, and um, maybe stay there in Cincinnati. We lived in Cincinnati at the time, but um, I remember the National Wild Turkey Federation was having their national convention that weekend down in Nashville, Tennessee, and I just knew that's where God wants us to go. So we switched directions, and we went about the same distance, uh, the other direction to the south where it was a bit warmer. It was Valentine's Day weekend, so um, in, in Ohio, I'm sure it does here, but in Ohio around February, it can get really cold, snowy sometimes. Michigan's even worse than that, but we... Um, we got to Nashville there on Friday, and I went in to check out the show. I mean, it was a really cool event. Got to see all the big hunters that I've been watching as a, since, since, since the time I was a kid. Will Primos and the Drury's and just a bunch of big-name hunting people. And, you know, it was funny. I went around and met everybody, and there was not all the big ooh and, and on that, that a lot of people have when you look at the fame of people on TV. I mean, they're just people just like us. We got in there Friday night, and we looked around and tried to find a place to where we could get, um, get an a into an area where we could pass tracks out. We don't have booths and stuff that we set up when we go to these big events because you have to beat your booth on Sunday, and we just, we're not going to compromise on that. So many times we pray and ask God to put us in a special area where these folks will be coming into the gate, and we can just pass out tracks without getting run out or kicked out. There's been a few, uh, one or two occasions where they've asked us to leave, but... Um, generally, God's always just protected us and allowed us to get in, in the right areas. Well, in Nashville, the Gaylord Opryland Resort is so big, people come from every direction. And there was really no public area that we could get into to pass out tracks without, I mean, if we focused on one area, we were going to miss 80% of the people coming from a different direction. And so we're scouting things out Friday night, and there was this one hallway Man, it was like a gold mine. It's like the Holy Spirit was saying, Darren, tomorrow morning when the gates open for Saturday morning, that's where you need to stand. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, being in the flesh, man, they're going to run us out of here. There's, there's no hope. We're, we're going we're to get kicked out. We don't have a booth. We're not paying. We're inside the gate. There's about three different hallways, stairways that all come down to this one hallway, and they had to walk that hallway to get into the front door of the show. 
So we got out there by leading of the Holy Spirit Saturday morning, and it was amazing. We had just got our first 15,000 tracks printed, and people thought they were getting information to the turkey show. People started lining up so they could get their gospel track. It was amazing. We start sweating. I mean, me and Ryan, we're doing everything that we can to get a track into everybody's hand as they're coming through. We get about an hour or so into the morning, and then there's a, a lady that comes up to me. She's in a blue shirt, says committee member on it. And I'm thinking, oh, man, we're done. We're going to get kicked out of here. And she's like, oh, man, she's like, we love Jesus Christ. She's like, we're thankful that you're here, and we just love what you're doing. You're welcome to do this. And I thought, whoo, man, big weight off of my shoulder. And about 45 minutes go by, and another gentleman comes up. He's a, um, he looked like a little bit more of a bigger deal, and he's got the blue shirt on, and uh, he's looking at the track. He'd, I, he'd already picked it up and looked at it, I could tell, by the way he was talking to me. And he said, what booth are you at? And I thought, oh, my heart sank. I said, we're done. And um, I said, well, sir, I said, we, we don't know, uh, or we're not selling anything, or we're from out of town. And, man, as I begin to tell him, I said, we're not, we're not soliciting or doing anything like that. He cut me right off. He said, no, no, sir. He said, we appreciate what you're doing here. He said, this is what we need all over the nation. And he said, you're more than welcome to come here anytime. You know, that morning God answered a big prayer through fasting and prayer. We were praying. I was praying and fasting about that particular weekend. And though I didn't go the direction I thought I was going to go, God put me in the place he wanted me to be in. And the first, first event we had, we gave out over 4,000 gospel tracts to people coming into that front door. As we got into the show later that day, around 1, 2 o'clock, um, I found one track laying on the floor. Out of the whole facility, across all the grounds, I found one track out of about 4,000 tracks that morning. We gave a few out the night before, but total, I think we were at about 41, 4,200 tracks, and only one we found on the ground. Man, God has really blessed our tracks. We want it to be a ministry as well, as God continues to provide the money. Uh, we'll continue to make it free and available, but... We're going to play the video here, and you'll get a good, good idea of everything of what we do. We are the Barnett family. My name's Darren, my wife Rachel, and our two kids, Ryan and Taylor. Some might ask, what exactly is an outdoor ministry? The devil today is using everything that he can to keep people out of heaven. And I'm afraid to our sportsmen, he's made them believe that creation is more important than our creator. So many uh, hunters and fishermen today set foot to the lake or the woods thinking, if I could just catch one more fish, if I could just hang a bigger buck on the wall, 
If I could have that new piece of hunting land, it, it would make my life a little bit happier. The Bible tells us the devil's a roaring lion that walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And you know, hunters, they're like a lot of people. They're just trying to find happiness in life. But I'm afraid the way they're trying to do it, it's never going to work for them. Six-day outdoor ministry, yes, it is unique, but it's not that different than other ministries you've heard of before. We have three targets in the crosshair. It is not that hard to find a sportsman, whether it be the opening day of hunting season, the local boat ramp, local archery shoot, or maybe even a large scale hunting show that can draw in as many as 175,000 sportsmen to one single event. There are over 35 million sportsmen in the United States, and many of them will die and go to hell without Jesus Christ. Our mission is one-on-one -on -one evangelism. Wherever God opens the door, we want to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to every sportsman that we can. Jesus told us, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And that is the most important thing of our ministry. The local New Testament church is the heartbeat of our ministry. We like to help churches organize sportsmen's banquets and wild game suppers to help hunters in their local community be exposed to the local New Testament church. There are so many sportsmen that will never step foot in church on a Sunday morning, but you'd be surprised how many show up when you give away a few door prizes, have a good meal, maybe offer a few activities, and then at the end of the night, we present them with the gospel and watch Jesus Christ change their life. But it doesn't just stop there. Once we see hunters come to know Christ as their savior uh, through local communities or through game dinners, we wanna help them get established in the local New Testament church so they can start their new walk with Christ. The Lord has really blessed our track ministry. And as the Lord continues to provide, we like to make gospel tracks available at no cost for others to carry on with the Great Commission. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? get coughing too much here during the message. It's been hitting me a little bit the last day or two, a little bit more. So um, I do want to say thank you so much for uh, just the opportunity to be here and present our work. I've had such a great time with the pastor. I thank you, brother, for uh, just the hospitality, the place to stay here. Uh, you guys have been so kind to us, and uh, we do not take it lightly. We're, we're very respectful and very appreciative of just how, how good you guys have been to us this past week. So um, if you have your Bible tonight, I'd invite you, uh, turn with me to the book of Second Kings. 2 Kings chapter 6, the Lord uh, laid this on my heart yesterday. I've been looking through it and studying it. Um, I've not preached this message in a really long time, and uh, I just felt this is where the Lord would have us to be tonight. Um, I would, uh, as you're turning there, I would remind you, if, if you've not signed up already, uh, out there at our table, you can sign up for our prayer letters. Uh, I try to write uh, sportsman devotionals about once a week. And then also, a uh, part of our ministry, we do filming, and I try to put the gospel message or some type of scripture, uh, to just a simple message that we can kind of incorporate with the hunt. And uh, it's been just a good outreach through social media and just drawing folks into the gospel. Uh, but if you would like those new video updates by email as well, you can sign up for that right there on the table. But um, if you found your place there in Second Kings chapter 6, I'd invite you tonight to stand for the respect of reading God's Word. So basically what's going on here, when you start in verse 8, uh, the, king of Assyria, the king of Syria is trying to move in on Israel. 
And old Elisha, he knows every step that he's taken, and Elisha goes to the king uh, to let the king of Israel know, hey, the king of Syria is doing this or doing that. And so Israel's always one step ahead of Syria. The king's getting aggravated, he's getting upset, and he's thinking somebody amongst the camp is uh, giving out our information to know what we're doing. Well, one of the servants says, no, Elisha, he's the, he's the cause, he's the reason uh, why Israel continues to know the moves that we're making. And so he sends his servant, he wants to snatch up Elisha and have him brought down to stand before the king. And let's look there, we'll begin reading in uh, verse 14 of 2 Kings 6. Or let's do 13. And he said, uh, Go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he hither horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master... How shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, uh, of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. And Elisha said unto them, This is not the way, neither is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom ye seek. But he led them to Samaria. And it came to pass, when they were come into Samaria, that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw, and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. And the king of Syria said unto Elisha, when he saw them, my father, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? And he, an- and he answered, Thou shalt not smite them. Wouldest thou smite those whom thou hast taken captive with thy sword and with thy bow? Set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. And he prepared great provision for them. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away. And they went to their master, so the... So the bands of Syria came no more into the land of Israel. We find our thought tonight there in verse 17. Look with me again. The Bible says, And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. The mountain of the master is our thought tonight. Uh, Please join me for prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you tonight and we thank you and we praise you, Lord, for all that you do. Lord, I need your help tonight. Lord, may the words spoken tonight be of the Holy Spirit. Lord, help me not to say anything that's not of you. Pray for every heart in this room tonight that the Word of God would speak. Uh, Help us, Lord, as your people. We praise you. We thank you for Christ and for the victory you give us through him. Lord, I pray that you meet with us, Lord. I know it's a Wednesday night. I know, Lord, that uh, folks have been out working and tired. And, uh, Lord, we just thank you for everyone that's come. And I do pray that you'd meet with us, please. We love you tonight. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated tonight. Uh, we look at the life of Elisha, and it's amazing how he encounters these difficult things in his life. But yet, as it, it's as if just it's everyday living to him. It's not a big deal. You don't see him welled up with fear or uh, worry about anything going on. Now, back in Elisha's day, we know that things were a little bit different than what we deal with today. We see Elisha himself uh, communing with God. I mean, he hears God speak to him. God would tell him to speak unto the people. Or his communication was a little bit different uh, than what we see today. But yet, he was still speaking to the same God. And yet, it was still the same words that we have today. I say that to say this. What is the Word of God in your life tonight? Uh, I was brought up in a church where, you know, we stood, at, uh, stood for the King James Bible. We uh, stood for the doctrines. Things were um, just very similar to where we stand here with everything. Uh, there may be a few things that were lacked at, at the church growing up, a few differences. But um, this is just a, a, a church that I was brought up in. 
I remember my grandmother being young. Or when I was young, I remember my grandmother sitting uh, on the rocking chair in her back room, and she would have her Bible open many times. Uh, the pastor of the church, I knew where he would stand on the King James Bible. But can I tell you tonight, when I become to the age of 24 years old, I come to realize that what the pastor stood on and what my grandmother stood on was not enough for me to understand to fight the fight in this world when we step out the church doors. And I would ask you tonight, when it comes to the Word of God, have you ever yourself got rooted and grounded to really understand what this book is right here? Because it's, it, it, it was that place in my life before I realized the fights and the battles that I would encounter that God would always be with me and God would always be faithful to me. Now I know the doctrine in the Bible is very strong here in this church, but I ask you, are you going with the flow of what the pastor stands on? Are you going with the flow of maybe uh, some, some family members in your life that you know they stood on this precious book? But if someone come and ask you, why do you use your Bible? Have you done enough research and have you done enough study to know why you stand where you stand? I'd encourage you. If you've never done that yourself, hey, get in the Word of God. The Bible tells us, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. And until we get rooted in that ourselves, we're not going to be much help outside these church doors. We're not going to have much strength. When we look at Elijah, or Elisha, I'm sorry, uh, we can see he had the Word of God and he trusted it. And when those things reared up in his life, he wasn't afraid. He wasn't scared at all. He knew God's faithfulness <coughs> and he knew God would always deliver. There's just three things I want you to see here tonight, and we'll be done. <clears throat> but first, put yourself in the place of this servant. And verse, look with me in verse 15. The Bible says, and when the servant, this is the servant of Elisha. Basically, he's, he's risen up and he looks in the uh, Syrian army has encamped Dothan. And as he looks, he's, he's not quite sure what to do. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early... And gone forth, behold, and host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And the servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? The enemy has moved in. We can see that he's afraid. We know that he's afraid because of verse 16. And Elisha answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. We can first see tonight this mountain of fear in this young servant. Can I ask you, what is keeping you tonight from being a witness for Jesus Christ? Uh, it took me many years in my younger life to realize that I was so afraid that God had a place for me in the ministry. I was afraid God was calling me to, to a, a life that I could not be happy in. And I ran from the Lord for a long time because of fear. I was too afraid of people. I was too afraid to, to talk. I was a very shy kid up through high school, just starting into college. And you know, fear did something to me. It caused me to walk in sin. It, it, it kept me from having a close relationship with Jesus Christ and just knowing who He really was. Uh, when I got saved at nine years old, there was one thing I could never get away from. All those years of living, I lived for the world for a while. I got saved at nine and it was about 24 before I really got right with the Lord and began to seek God for what He wanted for my life and just trying to know Him. But one thing I could not get away from in the bottom of my heart was that it, if Jesus Christ saved me and if He's the only way to heaven, we've got to tell other people about it. I just never did it. I let fear creep into my life because I refused to get into the Word of God and realize who God was and who God is and how much He loves us. And how when the Bible says that He never leaves us or, or forsakes us, that He's true with everything He says. And so I lived in fear. I brought some sin into my life, brought some destruction into my life. And that's exactly what fear does to each and every one of us tonight. Now, we can't figure out why life's empty for us as Christians sometimes. We can't figure out why uh, we can't just be happy and, and, and just enjoy life and what I've come to find in my life is, is fear. 
We're afraid of what people think. Here, he's looking at the enemy and he thinks, man, we're done for. You know, when we stand at the gas pump, I heard the pastor talking about it Sunday night. I love a man of God when he begins to talk about the gas pump and the, the telephone calls and the person in the grocery aisle because that's where people are and that's where we need to take the gospel to. And I would ask you tonight, what is it that's keeping you from slipping a track to somebody? Uh, we, the devil makes us think, well, you know, you don't know a whole lot about the Bible. You don't know a whole lot about the Romans road, but hey, think about this for a minute. The Apostle Paul, so many times in his life, when he would witness, he used his own personal testimony. He said, there was that time I was on the road to Damascus, and Jesus Christ met me there, and he changed my life. Can I ask you tonight, do you have that testimony? Do you have the burden to tell other, be, other people about Christ? I believe there's a lot of folks in our world today that sit in good, solid churches all their life and they never have a burden and they never have a testimony because they've never made a true profession in their own heart. You've got to be saved in order to have that burden and conviction to tell other people about Christ. And just quickly tonight, I would ask you to examine your personal testimony right now. How did God save you? What was it that brought you to the place that made you realize you were a lost sinner bound for a devil's hell and you saw your need to turn to Jesus Christ? It must start there. But maybe it's a Wednesday night, I understand that. Maybe many of you or all of you here might even be saved tonight. What's keeping you from telling others that story? Because if you have a personal testimony, that's where it starts. Hey, this happened in my life. So many times... I've told people, hey, this is how it happened for me. I won't get into uh, my testimony tonight just for sake of time. So many times I've used that. You know what? People, they're interested to hear your story. And guess what? From there, you can go into the gospel. And so many times I've found in my life that it's not just one or two scriptures or four or five scriptures that you use. The Holy Spirit literally will take you to different places in the Bible when you're dealing with different people. But can I tell you something? We never get to experience those joys and those fun things in, in walking with the Lord until we put fear aside. Can I ask you tonight, is fear keeping you from the will of God? Is fear keeping your family members from being saved? Is fear keeping those people that you interact with in the workplace, or like I said, the gas pump, or in the grocery store, or down at McDonald's, or the drive through is the fear in your life keeping those folks from knowing Christ? Hey, Christ died to save us. The Bible says, God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. We see in uh, Proverbs 29, 25, the Bible says, The fear of man bringeth a snare. In a country church like this out here, I'm sure everybody here knows what a snare is. That old coyote or fox gets his head stuck into a snare. You think of a dog warden, he comes to try to catch a hold of that loose dog, he gets that snare around its neck. You can't get out. The Bible says, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be saved. Are you trusting God tonight? Fear will always keep us in a place that we cannot please God and that we cannot live the victorious life. Hey, be careful about the things that you watch. Uh, I remember locally when we lived in Cincinnati there, uh, I went through a natural resources school and I had black bear management. And I learned a lot of cool things about black bears. They're not vicious animals at all. Now, you hear a weird situation sometimes. A lot of times they're in tourist areas where uh, bears will attack people. But a black bear, uh, like 90% of their diet is uh, green, the, the herbs and stuff. Um, they eat very little meat. They, they're not mean animals. They're, the, the, I think the average female black bear is like 150 to 200 pounds. And that's not really all that big. I remember uh, my friend, he was the game warden. I was working for Watercraft at the time in that county. And a, a young black bear, man, he come out of the den and he must have ran across six counties just checking everything out. Well, he got into town. It was kind of neat. We don't have black bears where we're at. And uh, he comes through our area. We were hearing sightings of him just down at the bottom of the hill where we lived. And he made it up into a, a kind of a, a town. It was a township, kind of a populated area. And the news media is just making this big hype about it. The local township police, now they're talking about, as soon as we see that bear, we're going to shoot it and kill it. 
And the game warden's like upset, like these guys don't have any, no, nobody needs to shoot this bear. He's just a young male, he's just come out of the den, and he's just crossing country because that's what young males do when they come out of the den. But yet every night you'd flip that TV on, and people are afraid to come out of their house. They're afraid to get out to the, take their garbage can from the road and get it back to the house because this bear is in the area. Everything that we look to in media today tries to drive fear into us. Say, hey, turn the TV off. Stop listening to what the world has to say because, again, the Bible says, the fear of man bringeth a snare. does not matter what man says. It does not matter what man thinks tonight. What matters is what the Bible says, and we need to get out of our comfort zone and begin telling this lost and dying world about Jesus Christ. The second thing I'd like you to see tonight, uh, there wasn't just a mountain of fear in this young man, but we look at Elisha, we can see there was a mountain of fullness, a mountain of fullness. Look at verse 17. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see, and the Lord opened the eyes of the young man. And he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. He says, open his eyes. Here, Elisha, he's dealt with the Lord so much, he has no fear of anything. He knows that the Lord is with him because he's a child of God. Can I tell you tonight, the Lord is with you if you're a child of God and if you've been saved. Again, he will never leave you and he will never forsake you. He was full of the Lord. And that mountain of fullness in Elisha's life, he was focused on heavenly things. He was not focused on this world. Can I tell you sometimes, as a turkey hunter, my mind tends to get a little bit more focused on Darren's success rather than what God has for me for the day. Then I get discouraged. Man, I didn't kill a turkey. I didn't see nothing. Man, life's so hard. Life's so tough. Life's not going the right way. I didn't get this and I didn't get that. Hey, listen to what the Bible says here in John 15, 11. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. God's come to show me that it's not the success in a turkey. It's not the success in a deer. It's not the success in a house or a car or a bank account. Our joy is found in Jesus Christ alone. But yet as Christians, we live this empty life we can't figure it out, can't, can't figure out why. And it's because we're not making the Lord the joy of our strength. I come to learn when I begin to get away from the world that the Christian life, it's not, not about a bunch of don't do this and don't do that. That's not what the Christian life is about. Now, when we begin to put sin out of our life, yeah, there is a lot of things we should not do. But what I learned when I began drawing closer to the Lord is as I took those negative things, those sinful things out of my life, I had to replace them with good things. I had to start reading my Bible every morning and every night. I had to start spending a real time in prayer just talking with the Lord just like I would talk to my wife or talk to the pastor or talk to a person. I heard one guy say something one time. He, he doesn't pray out loud because he doesn't want the devil to hear him. I thought that was kind of silly. I pray quietly sometimes, but a lot of times I fall asleep. I've come to find my best relationship with the Lord is when I can get into a quiet place and just talk to the Lord just like I'm talking to you now. There's something so real about that relationship. But it didn't just stop there. I began to get out and I began to tell people about Jesus Christ. I began to help people out in the church and I come to find out that this joy of the Lord was far better than anything that I'd ever experienced in life. I remember it, 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 I was growing closer and closer to the Lord and we were going to door, going door to door soul winning. I was the silent partner because I was shy. We're going door to door and I'd listen to the, the person in the church give the gospel and man, there was one deacon, he, I tell you, I, I don't, sometimes I wonder if he was saved or not, man. He was ready to knock the door over if someone shut the door and I'm thinking, man, is that the spirit of the Lord? And, and that would like drive me like, I got to start talking. I can't keep dealing with this kind of stuff. But I began to pray one time and I said, Lord, you know, I've been doing this door-to-door -door stuff now for about a year and a half. And to my remembrance, I've never won anyone to Christ one-on-one. -on -one. Not one time. I later found out just a year or two ago when I was little, 
I actually led my cousin to the Lord. I remember that, but I didn't think it, he really got saved. God reminded me that as a young child, he was putting that burden, and there were a few people I tried to witness to. But as I'm getting closer to the Lord here, around 25, 26 years old, I began to pray, Lord, I just would like to win one person to you. I've never done it one-on-one -on -one before. I went over to a neighbor with uh, hopes that I would witness to him and he would get saved. It was a Thursday morning and I thought, this is the day. Man, I went into his house and he didn't take it very well. He was dying of cancer and unfortunately, I believe he slipped off into eternity without knowing Christ. I was, it, was, it was hard. I, I walked away from his house that morning though and I was just defeated. I thought for sure that was the day God was going to answer my prayer. Well, I get down to the... Um, I had to go to a guy's house. I met this guy down at the boat ramp uh, when I was working. He was a big archer, man. He could split arrows in half. He was a target shooter, had nice bucks hanging on the wall. And I'm always open to learn new things about broadheads and how arrows fly. And I like, I'm always open. I like to learn. And so I'm talking with him at the ramp. Well, he had invited me to come over to his house. He was going to cut some arrows for me. And later that night, I, I, later that afternoon, kind of late afternoon, I got to his house and he's cutting the arrows. Well, over in Kentucky, it was only a 30-minute drive. I could deer hunt over there. And there was this one field, man, the beans were up, and I never saw, even to, to this day, I've never saw anything like it. Fifteen bucks would come out and feed in this bean field every night. And I'd take the video camera, and I'd just sit in the truck. I mean, five or six of these bucks were like monsters, just shooter bucks. It was awesome. And I was determined that that Thursday night, I was going to go sit on that field like I had been the last couple of nights. And as he's cutting my arrows, I begin to talk to him about Christ, I asked him, and... He thought he was going to heaven because he was a good person and kind of, uh, I was kind of nervous and shy and I just kind of left it there. I never said anything more and we went back to talking about hunting. We're all done and as I get to the driveway, I'm looking at the door handle on my truck thinking, I got to get in that truck so I can get over to that field before the night's over. It's getting late. I can still get there in time if I go now. But the Holy Spirit said, Darren, haven't you been praying about something? Haven't you been trying to witness to someone and win them one-on-one? -on -one? Finally, I just, just let it go. I had to die to myself. I had to die to myself and say, it's not about those deer, Darren. I turned around and I began to witness to the guy. He lost a son at nine years old. Hadn't talked about it in years. And in his driveway, he breaks down in tears, just bawling about all the things he's had bottled up in his life. He said, I need to be saved. We walked into the house. He sat down there on his couch and he called upon the Lord to be saved. And I remember driving away that day thinking, wow, this is amazing. There's more joy in this than, than any deer or any turkey or any fishing experience that I've ever had in my life. And I come to find that day that the joy that Christ gives us is far beyond anything in this world that we could ever have. I tell you that tonight, I would ask you, do you have joy in your life tonight? Are you walking daily close, walking daily close, close to the Lord and doing His will? Or do you feel a little empty? Do you feel like life's kind of tough and, uh, hey, I, I've been there. I, and even as a preacher, sometimes I go back in that direction sometimes. God has to open my eyes and give me that refocus again. But there's nothing in this world that's going to give us joy like Jesus Christ can. And telling other people about Him and watching a lost sinner come to know Christ as their Savior. Can I tell you tonight, that's the only reason we're here. This Life is a vapor. It's here for a little time and then vanishes away. And one day we're going to stand in the presence of God. The only thing that's going to matter is not about how much we owned or how much success we had in man's eyes. How many people did we tell about Christ? How many people did we help in the church? How much did we serve God with all of our hearts? Again, the Bible says, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. Lastly tonight, I, just, I want you to see lastly the, a mountain of forgiveness, and we'll be done. Look with me here in verse 21 of our context. And the Bible says, And the king of Israel said unto Elisha, when he saw them, my father, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? So basically, God has blinded the eyes of the enemy. And you know what Elisha says? They're coming to look for Elisha. He says, I'm not the right place. I'm not who you're looking for. You're looking for the king. And so God blinds them, and he leads them down to Samaria. And now these blind soldiers, they're walking into Samaria, and Elisha says, all right, open their eyes. 
and they opened their eyes in, their, in the midst of the king, they could have been killed so quickly. The king's, king of Israel, he's excited. He's saying, can I kill him, Elisha? But notice how Elisha responds. Verse 22, and he answered, Thou shalt not smite them. Wouldest thou smite those whom thou hast taken captive with thy sword and with thy bow? Set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. And he prepared great provision for them. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away and they went to their master. So the bands of Syria came no more into the land. And the Bible tells us, uh, that we're to love our enemy. And here we see Elisha setting such a very good example. He could have killed the enemy, but yet he gives him food and water. Can I ask you, do you have any enemies in your life today? Who is it in your workplace, or who is it in your family, or, or, or somebody that you know that you don't like? Some folks say, oh, I don't have any enemies. Man, I try hard not to have enemies, but I've come to find when I serve the Lord and when I just try to be me, there are, and there's people that I just cannot stand. And my flesh and my nature wants to hate them. That's the ways of Darren. The Bible says in Matthew 5, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Hey, we do not have it in our ability to love our enemies. I cannot love them according to my flesh. But you know, back to the beginning, if the Word of God would be the center of our life, if we'd read it in the morning and we'd study it in the evening, God shows us how we can love our enemies. Because the truth is, you know, those enemies, there's a good chance they're probably going to die and go to hell. The people that work amongst us, our family members, hey, it's our reaction to lash out at them when they lash out at us. But you remember what uh, the, apostle, or the, the apostles did in the New Testament? They were identified in the book of Acts as Christians. They were beaten just as Christ was beaten. Hey, do you remember Christ when he was hanging on the cross? He looks out to the crowd and he makes an impression on this thief hanging next to him. Because as, as they've beaten him to a place that they can't even recognize him, he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And here us, we, we say we're Christians, we, we say we're followers of Christ, but yet somebody says one little thing about us and we're ready to curse them to hell, aren't we? We just have the awfulest things to say. We, we begin to backbite and we talk to the other co-workers or the other family members or, hey, maybe even a safe person and maybe it's in amongst the church too. Because we don't love our enemies the way the Bible tells us to. Elisha set such a good example for us. The Bible says in Psalm 119, 165, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Hey, can I be kind to you tonight? Get over yourself. Stop worrying about what people do, and stop worrying about what people say, and ask God to help you love them. Because those people need to see what it's really like to be a Christian. I worked eight and a half years for the state of Ohio as a watercraft officer. I worked amongst people every day that hated God. Some claimed to be agnostic. They hated the work of Christ. You could talk about the Ohio State Buckeyes. You could talk about Buddha. But man, you talk about Jesus Christ and it was a whole lot different. And through those eight and a half years, especially the last year and a half, God was teaching me daily that everybody that is among you right now, Darren's going to die and go to hell. You are all they see about me. And I, I didn't, there were days I didn't want to love them. There were days that I didn't want to be kind and, and do things that were out of the ordinary for people to do. And I remember there was a guy that I worked with all the time. There was another officer we had trouble with, and um, I didn't like him. I, I struggled greatly. I really had to pray a lot to be right with God. There was another gentleman. He, he went to a Catholic church, and he was very devoted to it. And I worked well with him. I mean, I really, he was a good friend. We were just getting drug bust and alcohol bust and just working. I mean, he was a good friend. But sometimes I'd catch myself talking about this other officer with him. Here, a lost man. And one day we were sitting in the cruiser and I told him, I said, look, Pat, I said, I have a desire to be right with God. And what my Bible tells me is that I cannot treat him the way that I want to and have a right relationship with the Lord. 
I have to love him to maintain that relationship. And I remember over all those years, I still remember him sitting in the car that day just shaking his head. He said, you know, he said, I, I go to church. I, uh, I see the religion. He said, but I don't get this. I don't, I, I've never seen anything like this before. And that was God just showing me, hey, there are people among us. Now today, has he been saved? To my understanding, he's still not come to know Christ. But I know through that phase in my life, God was using me. And I tell you that to tell you this. Right now where you're at, God is using you in the places that you're in. And it's so important as believers that we maintain that love that Elisha here showed this enemy. But even a little farther than that, that we show the love that Christ showed us. Hey, we deserve hell tonight because we're wicked people. And Christ laid his life down and he paid it all because he loved us. Where are you at tonight? Let's pray. Lord, we love you and we thank you, Lord. I know we're a few minutes longer than we'd like to go tonight. And uh, Lord, just to help us, meet with us. I pray this message is spoken to hearts, Lord. I know you've used this so many times in my life. And Lord, day by day, I still need it. I still need your strength to uh, do those things that the flesh does not want to do. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Pastor.